I was born in Panther, West Virginia. That is in the southernmost part of West Virginia on the border of Virginia and Kentucky. I was born in a place called Panther, on July the 9th, 1921. I joined the service on the 6th of August of 1942. Uh, my first assignment was with the 80th uh, Division, which is called the Blue Ridge Division because it's the, the the patch is a picture of the Blue Ridge. It was a uh, Army Reserve unit, and most of the outfit was made up from people from from Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. So my first assignment was there, and they were stationed at uh, Camp Forest, Tennessee. And so I was there. Uh, I arrived there as a private uh, about the seventh or eighth of August of 1942, and I was assigned to. Uh, uh, headquarters company of an infantry battalion, 106, uh, 318th Infantry Regiment. Mm -hmm. Now, were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, I drafted, but most people don't understand what that means. Uh, actually, uh, I was a very, uh, I spent two years in the Civilian Conservation Corps, so when I went to college, Davidson College, North Carolina, I was a 20-year-old freshman. That was pretty old. So in February of 1942, I registered for the draft. In early March of 42, I received a congressional appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy, which I accepted, of course. And then I happened to think that really, uh, I don't know anything about the Navy, but I had a year of college ROTC Army, and I had something back in those days which most people never heard of called Citizens Military Training Camps, where I went to Fort Benjamin Harrison, uh, Indiana, for two summers to to be trained. So when I joined the 80th Division, I'd already gone through basic training and advanced training. So uh, promotions came very fast. Uh, in four months, I was a staff sergeant in the 80th Division. When did you go from enlisted man to officer? Well. Um, uh, I think sometime around maybe early November of 1942, when I was with the 80th Division, and the, one day there was a, a notice on the board that said the following men will, not may, will apply for Infantry Officer Candidate School, and my name was there. And so uh, in about a week or so, I was called before a review board, and I you know, went before a review board. And then, uh, uh, I guess about a, a month later, the uh, first sergeant, was a regular Army first sergeant, went home on Thanksgiving. And uh, so the company commander made me the acting first sergeant and promoted me to staff sergeant. And by the way, the regimental commander called me in and said, I want to congratulate you. You're the first man in the regiment to be promoted to staff sergeant. But anyway, a few days after I got promoted to staff sergeant, the regimental adjutant called me and he said, uh, uh, why aren't you in OCS? And I said, sir, I, I, I applied for it like I was supposed to. And I, I said, I assume I didn't clear the board because they he said, you cleared the board, you should have been the OCS a month ago. Now that company commander won't release you. And I'm going to, so uh, on December the 24th, 1942, I reported to Fort Benning, Georgia for the officer candidate school. When I was commissioned, I was sent to Camp Roberts, California. And there they had an officer school. It was for captains and lieutenants. Uh, the idea was, uh, you know, you're gonna go through the Pacific. So we're gonna have a four week course here at Camp Campbell, uh, Camp Roberts, California, to prepare you for combat in the Pacific. So my first assignment, I was a student there. And then when we graduated in f four weeks, instead of my going to the Pacific, I became an instructor in the school. So I was instructor in uh, platoon and infantry tactics for one year. So I had that training as an instructor. And then uh, instead of going to the Pacific at that time, they sent me to the Army Infantry Advanced Course back to Fort Benning for another 13 weeks. Actually, throughout my career, uh, I always preferred uh, 
to be in something in training. You know, in the, in the battalion level, it's the S3, that's training. And the division level, it's the G3, you know. And of course, that carries on up to training. So whenever I had the opportunity, uh, if I had a, a choice, I'd ask for an assignment, which put me in the training business. So, but I, I loved, uh, I loved training, and I enjoyed uh, teaching people how to do various things. When did they ship you out? Well, uh, after I got back from Fort uh, Benning at the Officers Advanced School, I came back in about October, and I was there for about a month, and they sent me to the Pacific. And I never will forget when we arrived to San Francisco to board a ship, the headline in the newspaper was, Jap subs off coast. Oh. So we got aboard this uh, personnel transport and they didn't tell us where we we're going to go, but in three weeks later or so, we landed at Noumea, New Caledonia, which was a French possession on the north, I'm going to say the northeast coast of uh, Australia. And I was there for about a uh, couple of weeks. Uh, what the, uh, the Army had a replacement uh, training center there. In other words, if they didn't know where you're going to go to, you went to uh, you went to New Maine, New Caledonia, to the training center. Then there's units in the Pacific needed people. They call back there and they send you to this. So I was there about two weeks, and one day with about ten other lieutenants, we were told to go down. We boarded a cargo ship, and oh, I don't know how many days later we landed on the island of Espiritu Santos, which is in the South Pacific of the New Hebrides. And there I was assigned to the 27th Infantry Division. And that's the division you would That's the division land with I was Canada. with in combat. Actually, when I arrived on Espirito Santos, I was assigned as the leader of the 1st Platoon I Company, 106th Infantry Regiment, 27th Division. So I had, a, I had an opportunity before we went to Okinawa to train with that platoon for about uh, three months, which was wonderful because uh, I got to know the men, they got to know me, and uh, uh, I told them that I was a staff sergeant when I got commissioned. And boy, they said, oh, you're one of us. <laughs> so we had a great rapport with those 29 men. Unfortunately, we all thought before we went to combat that we'd get our authorized strength. At that time, Infantry rifle platoon had an authorized strength of 40 men. I had 29, so he, when we went to Okinawa, uh, I had 29 men instead of 40. And they were mostly 18 and 19 year old good Americans, and I was the senior man of the platoon at 23 at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, we had, we had all kinds of, the, well, what we expected, of course, we didn't, I didn't know the big picture, of course. I was an infantry platoon leader as the first lieutenant. We didn't know the, the big picture, but later the big picture was that the Japanese were defending Okinawa with about 75,000 uh, individuals. That, they also, of course, Okinawan civilians, which, you know, that the history of the Okinawa goes back a long ways, too. And the Japanese annexed Okinawa in uh, 1875, if I recall correctly. Uh, so they had not only the Japanese army there, but they conscripted a lot of young men. So the estimates, this is from the higher up estimates, but there were about 75,000 people. It turned out there was 110,000 there. So what the uh, Admiral Nimitz, who was the commander in chief of the Pacific, and just for a matter of orientation, the sort of the northern part of the Pacific uh, was all under the Navy. And in the southern part, like New Guinea and Philippines with General MacArthur, Okinawa came under Admiral Nimitz. But anyway, on the 1st of April of 1945, the 10th Army Division, commanded by an Army Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, started landing on Okinawa. And what he did initially, there was, by the way, on Okinawa, there was four Army Divisions. There was the 7th, the 27th, the 77th, and the 96th. And there was two Marine Divisions, the 1st and the 6th Marine Division. So on uh, April the 1st, 1945, was, uh, the two Marine Divisions and two Army Divisions assaulted Okinawa. And they went into very little resistance. Well, little, I say, compared to what they had run into in other islands which we invaded, you know. 
But it turns out that the Japanese commander there had decided to defend the south. Okinawa, by the way, is 60 miles long and about 2 to 18 miles wide. And the two-thirds of the island is all hilly and brushy and scrubby and, and not d related very well to defense. So the, the Japanese defended the, 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 the southern one-third of the island. So, uh, but the, the uh, defense initially at the landing was very, basically very light. Everyone was surprised because there was very little resistance, which was unusual because normally when uh, the Marines or the Army had invaded an island, there was terrific uh, uh, casualties, going back to Iwo Jima, for example, for one. So anyway, the, the, by the end of the first day, we had gone in, across the entire island, so we cut the island in two. On the east side of Okinawa was the Pacific Ocean, and on the west side was the East China Sea. So we cut off. So we thought, well, anything in the north, uh, Japanese, we got we we got a line. The, so, and anything in the south, we're ready to go. And so it it turns out that the uh, the the commander of the Japanese forces had decided to defend the south, because the terrain there was more suitable for defense. And there were some old, old castles like Shuri Castle you may have heard about. There was a place for a good defensive position. So instead of 75,000 people there, which we expected, there was over 110,000. And that kept increasing as, as the fight went along. Uh, so after about the two army divisions headed south, and, and after on about day three, they ran into very, very heavy resistance. And the main defensive line uh, ahead of them was called Kakazu Ridge. And that was primarily the responsibility of the 96th Division to take Kakazu Ridge. As it turned out, my division, the 27th, was initially the floating reserve. But when the 96th Division ran into a lot of trouble on Kakazu Ridge, they finally secured part of it. Then my division, the 27th, went in to relieve the 96th. And at that time, I was the first lieutenant commanding an infantry rifle platoon of 29 men. So we relieved the 96th Division on this place called Kakazu Ridge. And uh, we had been told that the Japanese attacked every night around 2 a.m. But uh, we prepared good defensive positions. They did attack every night about 2 a.m., but we always repulsed them. And we got to think that they must have been drunk because you could hear them coming, yak, 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 and we found out that they probably were drunk on sake. <laughs> but anyway, uh, one thing we found out very shortly was that even though they attacked at, say, 2 a.m. And, 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 and at night, they believed behind some snipers. And of course, uh, the, the policy was in the Pacific that the U.S. Army divisions did not attack at nighttime. They did not attack at nighttime. So, um, what they would do in the morning, we'd get up and start moving around. They'd have snipers that were left in the air and they'd start shooting at us. So on about the, maybe the second morning or the third morning as we were there, the company commander said, uh, by the way, Luke, was my name Luke, my name is Lucas. So in the Pacific battles, uh, we didn't go by rank. I was not a first lieutenant. Nobody was a sergeant or a captain or a major. And um, so we went by we went by uh, we went by a, a nickname, and also we didn't wear insignia on our collars like they did in the in the, in the European theater. So uh, I, I was never called lieutenant. I was always Luke, you know. So anyway, uh, the company commander said, "Well, Luke, you take a, a patrol out and see if there are any Japanese snipers that came here overnight." So I got. Uh, 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 three of my, my platoon members. And as I was getting ready to move out, we overnight we had been uh, spent with us was a second lieutenant who was a forward artillery observer. He spent the night with us. And I was moving out, he said, um, uh, can I go along with you? I want to get some combat experience. And I said, well, you know, just fall into the rear. Well, we'd gone out maybe a couple hundred feet and there was a very, very loud explosion. And uh, knocked me down. 
two men behind me were knocked down. The only man standing was the scout in front of me. But I heard these moans and crying and really terrible noises. And I was, in, of course, in shock because I'd been knocked down too. And I was trying to find what was going on. I looked down the hill and there was this forward, second lieutenant, forward observer. And uh, both of his legs had been blown off just below the knees. And he was lying with his head uh, down the hill. And I, I didn't realize what was going on. I finally went down to him and I seen what was happening. He had two legs blown off. So I took my, my belt and made a tourniquet on one leg and I took his belt and made a tourniquet on another leg. And I told these, the one man of the three who was still standing to go back to the company, get an aid person with a stretcher to come up and take this man back there. And so when uh, that the stretcher would take the man back and the, one of the men said to me, Luke, your back is covered with blood. Now, I didn't realize that my whole back had been shattered with, sh with shrapnel. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I, I did, so anyway, we, we walked back to the battalion aid station, I guess, I don't know how far back, but we finally got back there. And I said to the battalion surgeon who was dressing me, taking the shrapnel out and dressing me, I said, now, please don't report this because I had a brother who was in Europe and he was seriously wounded and he's in the hospital. And I said, I don't want my family, my mother and father, to know that the other son, the only other son, has also been wounded. So I saw him about a month later and he said, well, Luke, he said, I look at the regulations, I have to report the fact that you're wounded. So anyway, that resulted in my receiving the Purple Heart. I've often felt very guilty about that because here's a man who lost two legs and when he said, can I join you? I could have said no. I could have said no. And he'd have two legs today. So that's always been a very heavy thing against me. But one good thing is I found out years later that he did survive. He did survive. So I, that, but uh, I could have said no, you know, you can't do it. And uh, he, he'd had two legs today. So that's sad to me there. What kind of fighters were the Japanese? Well, the Japanese uh, were good fighters, particularly when they were defending a hill or a ridge or some, uh, some objective that we tried to take. Uh, they were probably the, of all the defenses units in the South Pacific and the Air Pacific, Japanese were probably the best at defense because they they dig down down hundreds of feet, hundreds of feet, hundreds of feet, and so you'd even have artillery in there, and you, you know, and it didn't touch them, didn't touch them, you know, not, not at all. I can remember on Kakasu Ridge, we used to look over to the escarpment, and they had had tunnels dug from the far side, and they come up, and their face of the tunnel was facing us about maybe 1,500 yards away on Kakasu Ridge, and they'd fire at us. And of course, you know, we, sound travels at the rate of 1,086 feet per second, so when we'd see uh, the flash, we'd start counting, and then over how many seconds we got, then we'd call artillery. But our artillery come in, they just go back in the hills. Mm -hmm. So they're very good at that. But the Japanese, uh, uh, I think the most unusual thing about the Japanese, which I didn't understand until much later when I got to Japan uh, in September of 1945, sometimes you come face to face with a Japanese soldier. And instead of him fighting, he'd kill himself. He had a, they had grenades, and their grenades were different from ours. They had to hit, hit the ground and put them back. They'd kill himself. Well, I under, didn't understand that why until I got to Japan and began to study the Japanese uh, as, a, as a nationality and their history. And found out, of course, the Emperor Hirohito, you know, was at that time the Emperor of Japan. And he was the Supreme Commander of the Army and the Navy and the Air Forces. And when you were born in Japan at that time, you took an oath that you would defend and die for the Emperor. So the feeling I got was that they would rather kill themselves, they're dying for the emperor, than have me kill them. Okay. And so that, that surprised me. And then um, uh, I, I don't know, but it seems, 
at nighttime when the attack, you could, you could hear them coming, you know, they, yeah, you know. And someone said later that they were high on sake, you know, Japanese liqueur or some kind, I guess. And you could hear them coming. So, but uh, they were they were very good. They they uh, uh, very few of them surrendered. I, I didn't. I didn't. Um, my outfit. Um, uh, we didn't take any any Japanese prisoners because they would they would rather die. So they were very tenacious. They were good defenders. And uh, you know you uh, you had to kill them to take uh, a ridge or a strategic point that the army wanted you to take. So they they were good fighters. They were good fighters. But uh, uh, again, uh, I was surprised and didn't know them many year uh, months later why they killed themselves. The big thing on Okinawa that was really uh, significant in our being able to advance. The U.S. Navy had the largest uh, number of aircraft carriers, battleships, destroyers, cruisers, PT boats than they had any place else in the Pacific. So when I, like, a, we wanted to get some some fire. We we first we get our own mortar fire, and then we get our own division artillery fire. But when there was a forward observer, forward artillery observer, observer and you tell him that you wanted to put some fire on a certain place. Now you might get army uh, artillery or you could get Navy gunships. And I mean, they could really throw in a lot of stuff. So I would say that um, in many areas, we were able to uh, conquer a ridge or something like that because of the naval gunfire that we got, because they, they were big bombs, you know, <laughs> they really tore up a lot. So, uh, of course, the Japanese, again, were on the south part of Okinawa, particularly uh, some of the old uh, buildings that were there underground. The Japanese were underground there a couple hundred feet. And, uh, of course, it took uh, from, well, the island was supposedly called secured on the 23rd day of June, but that don't mean a great deal, of course. It just means that uh, we're in control. The Japanese, uh, again, had uh, the, in the south, the ridges were east-west, which was ideal for defense, as opposed to the north, which was hilly and mm -hmm. brushy, and so the Japanese had very few people up there. So they had these series of ridges going all the way back, and now, of course, from the time we hit them to go south. It's only 20 miles. 20, is that right? Uh, uh, 60, uh, yeah, that's right, about, tw about 20 miles. But it, every inch was defended, not only by the Japanese soldiers, but the Japanese military of all branches. And they had, they had uh, of course, the Japanese, uh, the Okinawan civilians. They had them in there, too. So uh, it was a, uh, it was a, it was a, a difficult, and it, uh, one thing that, that slowed us down on Okinawa was in, in May, when we were making pretty good progress toward the south of the capital of Okinawa was called Naha, and that was the main objective because we knew that's where the, the commanding general of the Japanese forces had his headquarters. But in May, um, uh, it had, they had uh, 16 inches of rain. And I recall that uh, at that time, my battalion was attacking in the north of Vietnam. And I remember a place called Onataka, and it was sort of straight up, and we couldn't go hard to get up the hill because it was so raining so much. So that, that slowed down the people, uh, people a lot. So the, the Marines took a lot of casualties. They had two divisions in there. The Army at that time had three were fighting. So we had suffered t terrific casualties. Uh, to get through there, but uh, of course uh, we finally made it. But it took it took a long time, and and we had a lot of casualties. Talk a little bit about your advancement, I guess, uh, in in responsibility because of all the uh, all the events that were happening there. You started as a platoon commander, went up to a company commander, eventually an intelligence officer, and. <laughs> and other roles all during the time of this battle. Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned, I had uh, 
started out with uh, 29 men in this platoon, and we should have had 30. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, as I'll mention later, the number of casualties that I suffered at my platoon. So I, I was a platoon leader initially. And uh, of course, uh, later on, I'd like to tell you how I got a different job, if I may. But uh, we, uh, the weather uh, was a, a factor, the visibility was a factor, and the Japanese tenacious defenders was a, was a, was a factor also. Uh, but eventually, uh, uh, we uh, were able to proceed toward the, the, the south. At that time, the, my division had been detail to go go back up north because we first marine six marine division it went up there initially uh, in that those mountains areas and uh, 30 miles up there the Japanese uh, as they were being pushed back in the south they get in boats and go back to the north but anyway uh, uh, on the 23rd day of uh, June uh, the island was declared secured. And I, I just want to mention that General Simon Bolivar Buckner, Lieutenant General Army, uh, he was visiting a Marine observation post and he was killed. And the senior general on the island was a, a major general Marine Corps. So the first time in the history of the Army, a Marine commanded an Army. Mm. <laughs> when we left Cockasoo Ridge, to head south, we assumed that the jet that when we left there, that another army unit would take over in the reserve. It turned out that that didn't happen. So the Japanese they uh, they took over the Kakasu Ridge area. So my battalion was withdrawn from the south to help retake Kakasu Ridge. Anyway. Um, we were at attacking, and it so happens that my platoon was on the left flank of the entire force that was attacking. And we were on the side of a hill, and I'd go from one little gully to the ridge and down and so forth. And as we moved along, I'd have a, I had a scout, a two scouts, and a BAR man, Bounty Automatic Rifleman. And the rest of the platoon, I'd keep in the draw with the platoon sergeant, but somewhere, I don't know, exactly when, but uh, we ran into the Japanese and my lead scout was killed immediately. And the BAR man was seriously wounded and I crawled over to him and he'd been shot through the left upper thigh, right through the bone and everything, and he was screaming. And I was crawled over to him and by, in a minute or two, the first aid man come running up. And each platoon had a first aid man, by the way. And I thought, well, geez, he was back in the draw, but the BAR man who had been wounded in the th left thigh was screaming. I guess he heard him. So he came up, and I was on my knees trying to do something for the BAR man. And the first aid man came up, and he got on his knees right beside me. And in by the way, as I mentioned, or didn't mention maybe, the the lead scout was killed instantly. He was, you know, he was in front and he, he got killed instantly. The first aid man came up and we were both on our knees uh, trying to help the BAR man. And as the first aid man was reaching for his first aid kits, the Japanese opened fire and killed him immediately. And that's the only time that I could ever hear the bullets whizzing by my head. And I knew that I came within, you know, two or three minutes of being killed myself. And I often ask, why not me? And even today, I, I said, you know, I came so close to being killed, why not me? But anyway, uh, that was in the battle, but then I got a call to go back to the company headquarters. And the company commander said, the last officer in K Company has been killed or wounded. And the battalion commander wants you to take over K Company. Well, I took over K Company, and, uh, uh, and then I, they, uh, the staff, the S3, got dengue fever and got evacuated, and they made me the acting S3, and, 
it went on from there, and I never did get to go back to the company. I stayed in the staff either as the intelligence officer or as the plans and operations officer from about August of 1945 until the division went home in December of 1945. And so uh, during that period, I got promoted to captain. Given the vicious fighting that you experienced on Okinawa, how relieved were you when we dropped the bombs on Japan and you knew you didn't have to be part of a ground campaign there? Well, if you'd been on Okinawa that night, you, you had never known how the sky could be lit up. You know, <laughs> uh, we, we, you know, we, know what, we just knew that the Japanese surrendered. We didn't know, we didn't know why they surrendered. We didn't mm. know there was an atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We didn't know that. We just know the Japanese surrendered. The word got out. And believe me, all night long, everybody was shooting their weapons up into the sky you know so it was a it was a it was a great blessing and you know uh cause the the war was over and we had suffered so many casualties uh, throughout the pacific and europe of course as a matter of fact uh, during world war ii we lost uh, 406,000 americans you know and uh, that's in the Pacific and in Europe altogether. So we were we were very pleased, and of course we didn't know what was going to happen. But it turned out that uh, on the 5th of September, my battalion was already lifted to Japan, and as I mentioned, we our job was to do to demilitarize uh, uh, Japan, and we were given a, 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 a section, the west section of the, the island of Honshu, to demilitarize. That's where I got. The samurai sword. Well, the officer's sword. I got it. Uh, I think on the out on the on the uh, Kakazu Ridge, and it's uh, amazing that I have that sword today because uh, uh, our chaplain, our battalion chaplain, when we were in defensive position, he'd always come up and have services, you know. And believe me, everybody went to service, you know. <laughs> and so. Uh, I had this blame beside me. He said, um, what you going to do with it? I said, well, I don't know. I said, it's sort of nice, and I like the way I got it. He said, well, you know, I got a Jeep, and I, I put it in my Jeep in the trailer. And I said, okay. So I forgot all about it, and we got to Japan. Uh, well, I, we got there the 5th of September, and sometime after that, he said to me, oh, he said, um, uh, he said, Luke, uh, I've got your, your uh, Japanese officer's sword. So that's how, it's amazing how I got it to him. Yeah. So it's been precious. I have three grandsons, and when they were very small, they'd come out and say, Granny, can I see your swords? And they all they all won them. So I've got three grandsons and two swords. This is a samurai <laughs> sword. So this is going to be a big decision for me, how I, how I distribute two swords to three grandsons. <laughs> <laughs> the primary objective that I learned was to protect your men, protect your men. You know, you might you have the army. If you want to hit, take a hill, they'll give you part. You call it the objective, or later on they might call it the goal or something. But I found out if your men comes first, first, you know, they may tell you to take a hill, but the taking that hill is not first to me. Taking that hill was. Had, take it without any loss of my men. So, I, ever since that time, I've been, I've been uh, personnel oriented. The rest of my life, uh, I've been personnel, personnel. And so, it's uh, take care of your men. However, I just mentioned here that uh, uh, I landed on Okinawa with uh, 29 men. They were 18, 19 years old. And at the time I led them was about maybe six weeks or so before I went to the battalion staff. Uh, seven of those young men got killed, and 14 got seriously wounded and evacuated, and I never saw them again. And uh, they're, they're, they're part of my life, and I think of them every day, and I can see them, and I wonder what their lives would be like today if they weren't a casualty of World War II. And I wonder about the families when they got word that their son was, you know, 
killed in action and, and so forth. So uh, that's the reason that I delayed coming here for, for a long, long time because it is not a pleasant experience because it, 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 uh, it recalls, even though I had, I commanded a rifle company uh, briefly on Okinawa before I went to the staff. I, later on, I've commanded rifle companies, constabulary troops. I've commanded battalions. I've commanded brigade in the 82nd Airborne Division, or chief of staff of the 82nd Airborne Division. I was a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the military committee to NATO. I had a lot of jobs, but uh, nothing uh, was like leading a platoon of 29 young men. Unfortunately, as I say, uh, many of them didn't make it back to her, their home. I was a student at the Army War College in 1960 and 61, and I got a call from the personnel office in headquarters, uh, UCOM in Heidelberg. And they said they, uh, there's an opening for a G3, that's planned, that's training up in Berlin, and we've nominated you for that position. Uh, will you take it? And I said, well, you know, that's behind the, I call that, that's in the Soviet zone, 112 miles from the British zone into the East Germany and West Germany into uh, Berlin. And they said, well, look, look at this. If you take it, uh, your wife and family will go with you. You will fly first class in aircraft. When you get to Berlin, you'll be bent. They'll take you to a house which is already furnished, the refrigerator's full of food. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> well, I, I got there in Berlin on the third day of September 1962. And thir 10 days later, uh, August the 13th, the Japanese, uh, uh, the Germans, East Germans started building the wall. And of course, I was the G3 plans, operations, and training. And about midnight, I got a call from my operations post, which we I was responsible for, that uh, something's wrong. Our patrols cannot get into East Berlin. So we alerted all the staff, and we uh, uh, got ready. And of course, I was the G3, and I was supposed to make recommendations as to what to do, you know. And, I'd only been there, what, 10 days, but I had a, a very good staff, about 45 or 50 people. My deputy was a major West Point graduate, an outstanding officer who eventually made three stars. And he said to me, you know, we have one tank that has a bulldozer on the front. So when I was supposed to, as a G3, I'm supposed to re recommend to the commanding general what we should do, one, two, three, four, in this order. And do I have the approval of the G1, the G2, the G4, and so forth? So the, the, of course, it was a big problem, and the Allied staff, with all the generals, they had a meeting. So I made my presentation to the chief of staff, who was a brigadier general, and he said, that's fine, Jim, when the, when the uh, commanding general of the uh, Berlin, U.S. Forces Berlin comes back, you know, make a presentation. And so, uh, when the commanding general came back to the Allied meeting, he said, the decision has been made, there will be no military actions. Everything will be political. And so uh, the chief of staff said to me, now, Jim, I want you to put that in writing and put it in your safe in case it ever comes up. Well, but it did come up about two years later. Hmm. The part of the Army sent a message in saying, do you ever consider turned down the wall. Chief of Staff said, Jim, just send him back a copy of your orders, which I did. But I was in that job for 28 months. Uh, and of course, it was uh, uh, on the 19th of October of 1962, we almost went to war. Uh, we had a, a tank company which had 35 tanks and uh, the, head, the headquarters in Heidelberg re reinforced us with another battle group, so we had three battle groups. So up on the, the, the east-west border between the U.S. and the Soviet sector, uh, uh, we had tanks up there. We had 
infantry went up there, and the and the Russians. You probably heard of Checkpoint Charlie. Is that you? Yes. But that's where the so we had we had some tanks up there, and the major who commanded those tanks was with them, and we and he's coming back to me. I'm the G3. I'm supposed to recommend what to do, and so we were there, and our tanks were loaded and with ammunition. And if we'd give the order to fire, they could just fire like that. And so we sat there f overnight until the next day, about 10 o'clock in the morning. The major called me and he said, you know, the Soviet tanks had withdrawn. And General Lucius D. Clay, if you've ever heard of him, he was, uh, after World War II, he was the commander of Berlin. And a lot of things from today, like this Clay Alley and so forth. He was with us, of course. And I said to him, I said, to General Clay, I said, the Soviet tanks had withdrawn. And he had a direct communication with President Kennedy, and he picked up the line and said, Mr. President, he said, we have won. The Soviet tanks have withdrawn. So things began to cool down. That was 19th of October, 1962. But of course, you know, the wall didn't come down until, what, 1989. But right. I was in that job for uh, 28 months. I finally got permission to trade job with another friend of mine and took over the infantry battalion, and, and that's where I stayed until I came back to the States in 64. 